Good morning and welcome to TPN Credit Bureau YouTube channel. With me in studio today is Justin the Side Note. We're swapping out everybody this week. <laughs> it's wonderful uh, to have you here with me today. Justin, the head of operations at TPN, is going to be facilitating with me today. He's going to be asking me your questions um, as well as probably any queries that come up during the session. Absolutely. I hope you're going to interrupt me. I don't want to be speaking just by myself for the next half an hour or 45 minutes. So please feel free uh, and welcome to do so. Just before we get going, a few housekeeping roles before we get started. Remember, you need to be logged into YouTube to be able to access the chat, to be able to ask all those questions. So please go and do so now if you haven't done so. Secondly, we are going to run a 15 minute Q&A right at the end of the formal session in which we will go through all the questions that I'm not dealing with during the session. So Justin, please save those for us and ask me all of those questions during the Q&A. We will also be posting a feedback form, vitally important not just for our own feedback and perhaps new training that you'd like or new things that you'd like to see from the TPN system, but obviously also important for your unverified CPD points. So please go and complete those for us during the 15 minute Q&A right at the end. And then, we're dressed in blue today. If you're not seeing us in blue, please go and select the cog at the right hand bottom of the screen and go and select 720p or higher. Um, we didn't get dressed up for nothing, so no. yes, important, good. Okay, so just as a short introduction, what I'm going to take you through today is the TPN Credit Bureau system. I'm going to showcase how to do your credit checks, um, how to uh, do enforcement actions, sending out letters of demand, blacklisting through the system, through TPN collections. Vitally important for your own processes. I always say this when I present webinars, but rentals is administration based. If you don't like admin, <laughs> not necessarily the right thing when it comes to your rentals. So ranging from your application forms, your lease documentation, how to perform credit checks, how to and when to send letters of demand, all really come into play with your rental practice and in making yourself a successful rental business or a successful landlord. As you see with the topic today, we said that 75 or 76.5 percent of tenants are currently paying in their good standing period. So they're actually paying rental on time uh, within a grace period or before the end of the month. It is nice at the moment. We can see that increasing, but there is obviously that 25 percent to odd that you are currently sitting with that is not necessarily doing so. So we're going to cover both bases. We're going to cover bases from a proactive standpoint when it comes to your credit checking before you actually rent out the property, as well as what to do when things go wrong at your rental property. So I'm going to take you through the system demo. I'm going to showcase exactly how to do those credit checks, what to look out for, what they look like, the type of data that you get through from the TPN system. We might delve into a little bit of other products uh, while I'm going through this. Perhaps we might do some monitoring or yes, we will do some monitoring today. Um, and remember, just for all of those that have not yet seen the video that we did um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago regarding the Property Practitioners Act, you can also go and have a look at that after the session. We've updated all of our leasing documentation, our sales documentation, both from a residential and commercial perspective, to ensure your compliance with the Property Practitioners Act. So if you've got questions regarding that, you're more than welcome to post that in the chat. Justin will handle those throughout the Q&A session right at the end. If it's specific questions, Justin, if you wouldn't mind, while I'm busy going through the system, just interrupt me and we can Perfect. handle those throughout the session. Peter, we're also going to be running a couple of polls throughout the session. So we're going to stick one live now and then the guys can also give their feedback. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And now to think how many polls is there? Three polls. That yeah, we're three doing polls today. Yeah. Wonderful. So Justin's going to put up those poll questions as we go throughout the session. So to get started, one of the most important things and the way I usually start off this training is by showcasing the credit checks, but a very specific credit check. It's called the TPN Rent Check Inquiry. And this Rent Check Inquiry is only available to clients who submit data into the credit bureau system. What I mean by data is I mean how your tenants are paying each and every single month. So that might be through your property management system, say for example your pay props, your MDAs, uh, your rent book systems, it can automatically push through that data into TPN. 
I love starting off with that because as much as it seems like an administratively burdensome process, it really isn't. If you're utilizing a property management system, you're utilizing Rentbook, it's very simple to push that data through to TPN. The reason why I start off with this as well is it aids in your collection. I want you to see this as a process, just like what with your normal rentals processes, that is going to assist you in collecting rent at the end of the day. The reason for that is through the submission of data into the credit bureau system, your tenants credit profiles are going to be negatively or positively affected based on how they've made payments to you. They will also receive a free SMS from TPN indicating that they've either paid their rental on time, within a grace period, paid late, they haven't paid their rental, or they've made partial payments. I'm going to show you how those colors work specifically on the credit check and the type of data that gets pushed through to TPN from the system. But like I said, this rent check inquiry that I'm going to be running to, to, through today is only available if you submit data into the Bureau. I think it's an important stopping point. If you're unsure of how to submit data, please feel free to contact our help desk, helpdesk at tpn.co.za or give us a call on the 0861876000 number. You can also email data at tpn.co.za and they're going to assist you in getting your data into the system so that you can see and you can view all this information that I'm going to be showing you today. So to get started, if you're not yet a subscriber to TPN, very simple. Once again, you can subscribe online or you can email the help desk email address and one of our sales representatives will contact you, most probably Corin, to get you set up online on the system so that you can start your credit checking, your letters of demand and your enforcement action today directly through the Bureau. So once you've logged in through your unique username and password, you just go and click credit checks right up at the top. I'm going to split the session into three sessions today. We're going to do credit or rather four. We're going to do credit checking. Then we're going to run through your my data tab. So enforcement actions. And then we're going to go through specifically your monitoring thereafter. So incredibly important stuff that we're going to be dealing with today and how to ensure that you get the best out of the system, but the best out of your tenants and the best out of your rental properties as well as an agent or an individual landlord. So once I've clicked on credit checks, there's a number of things that you can do through the system. You can run new consumer credit checks, you can run new deed searches, you can run a new uh, know your client check, which is a FICA verification check. We go and run the person's ID against uh, the National Populations Register, as well as the Department of Home Affairs information, and we provide you with immediate feedback whether that person is FICA verified. So it does the actual ID, it does your address, as well as uh, that on the person's contact number if that has been selected. The pre-assessment check is not a credit check. The pre-assessment check is purely for things like viewing of properties with tenants or with prospective purchases even possibly prior to them actually filling out an application form or a lease agreement. It's going to give you a couple of credit report indicators. Uh, it's not going to give you all of the credit information, but it's going to tell you if a person's got judgments or defaults loaded on their profile. So all of those available directly from that top box. You can obviously do new business credit checks. Those are credit checks on PTY Limited's closed corporations and trusts. And then you can trace consumers. Say, for example, a tenant has moved out of a property or absconded and you need to know where the, prep, uh, where the tenant is because you need to serve a summons or send out further um, legal action. You can do so simply by tracing by ID, passport number, surname, date of birth or telephone number. You can also have a look at your credit check history as well as the mailbox. Mailbox is important for people. Perhaps we've got some schools online today. Uh, when you're requesting things like your, um, your, your criminal checks or your criminal investigation checks through the system, uh, then we're going to provide you with feedback directly in your mailbox. But for today's purposes, I'm going to run through a credit check on an individual just by clicking the top box over there. Make sure it will be automatically selected, but you'll see that the inquiry reason has been set out as rental setting limits for goods or services. Very important for our property customers. That must always be set as that. Your reference, you can go and complete anything you'd like. Property details, it's just easier to match up the invoices to um, the specific property that you're renting out or the credit checks that you've run. An RSA ID number or a passport number is required. You can change the passport number directly through clicking the button right over there. 
and then you can go and complete those for us. First name and surname. Very, very, very important over here. Take the first name and the surname directly off the person's ID documents. Don't take it off the application form because as you know, people have AKAs, they call themselves something different. So it's important to go directly off the ID documentation or even if you've run a KYC check, you can take it directly off there. The current address where the person is currently residing, not an address where the person is moving to, but where they're currently residing. You can go and complete it for me over there. Postal code, province, cell number, and landline number or self-explanatory. Once that has been completed, just click on the next button. I would suggest on the step to confirm consent that all clients go and perform a gold credits score. The reason for that is the gold credit score includes an affordability assessment as well as a squat score. I'm going to showcase that to you on the actual credit check, but just so that you know, we do have three options available over here, basic, civil and credits. The basic credit check is a um, the default application score through TPN. The silver critics includes an affordability score and the gold critics includes the affordability as well as the squat score. Once you've selected your gold critics, you fill out the net monthly income of the party and the total installment that they're paying on the rental. You can obviously select multiple parties paying the rental. So if there's two, you can set it that way or three or four, whatever you'd like. Consumer verification. Okay. So I find this incredibly important. We've built a new system into the TPN Credit Bureau pro, uh, uh, platform that you can actually run verified biometric checks on your tenants. So you are assured that the person you're actually, uh, you, you've actually found for the property, uh, viewing the property for, applying for the property is actually the person standing in front of you. So that you do simply by clicking on verify biometrics What's going to happen there is that the tenant or the potential tenant at least is going to receive a link. They can go and click on that link and directly through a selfie, it will verify the person's uh, photograph versus the person's photograph that's been captured on DHA as well as the National Populations Register. An incredibly important one I feel to go and do. I can't tell you, Justin, how much fraud there is out there when it yeah. comes to the rental industry and people renting properties in other people's mm. names. It happens very often. So make sure you are doing the best that is available to you to protect your investment and your business. Remember to click on the NCA compliance declaration right at the bottom. This means that you have been given consent to run a credit check. Very important over here. In terms of the National Credit Act, you always need consent to perform a credit check. It needs to be written. You can have it on your application forms. But please make sure when you're running credit checks, you've got consent to do so. Justin, do we have any questions? We do, Peter. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> we've got a question here asking, do we need permission from the tenant in order to do a trace check? I like that question. No, you don't. Not to perform a trace, but to perform a credit check through the system, yes, most certainly. Uh, with your KYCs and your uh, pre-authorization, no, uh, or prior authorizations, no, but for the, crim uh, for the credit checks, you can hear I presented on criminal <laughs> stuff Check, yesterday. Yeah. For the credit checks, most certainly, you definitely need to do so. Great, thank you. And then there was another one uh, asking, can we use an asylum number if the prospective tenant does not have either an ID or a passport number? Justin, I believe you can use the asylum number directly through the system um, by clicking on passport uh, checks. Um, the person would possibly have a passport in that case as well. Um, they ought to be, But yeah. they ought to be. Um, but like I said, if you've got any queries regarding that and the system's not allowing you to do the check, it's really as simple as emailing our help desk or calling the normal contact number and then they will assist you through putting the correct details into that first page. Great. And then we just got some feedback from our first poll that we ran. We asked our uh, delegates if they were optimistic about 2022 as property practitioners and we had 198 responses. and. The general feeling is yes, 78% think so, 16 are not too sure. Well, that's, that's better than the good standing ratios, isn't it? it so is, yeah, I'm it happy is. with 78%. It's, Let's all be very positive for the year, I think. People seem optimistic. <laughs> Great, thanks Justin. So, once you've completed your step to confirm consent, click on the next button right over there. This is now going to allow you to select different reports. 
Now, like I said right at the beginning, if you submit data into the Bureau, this TP and rent check inquiry is automatically going to be ticked for you. It is the best upper tier echelon inquiry that we've got through the system. At a price of 68 Rand 92 cents, you are going to get all the information that I'm going to showcase through the rent check inquiry, including things like your TPN individual, TransUnion individual, your TPN deeds on file, your ID verifications, SIPSI data, deeds office information, as well as that very valuable SACRA or South African Consumer Risk and Reporting Association data on how the tenant pays all their other credit accounts, uh, service providers, the banks, loans, etc. Very important. That's the one you want to be doing. That's the one that is going to give you all the information to make an informed decision of whether this applicant should actually be in the property. You can, through the system, also perform a bank account verification, a qualifications check, perhaps, if you're employing people as a property practitioner, look at that, not a state agent anymore, as a business property practitioner, as well as if you're a school perhaps joining us today, like I said, you can perform a TPN criminal check as well. That is actually going to give you criminal information on that specific person. So once I have selected, or not selected rather, you're all going to submit data and that rent check inquiry is going to be automatically ticked. You can click on perform credit check. And like magic, your criminal, your criminal check, wow, your credit check is going to be automatically displayed for you on screen. Um, just one quick administration one on this. Please don't go and click control P when you want to print out this report. You can just click on print report on the left hand side and then it's going to print the entire report for you so that you're insured of not just getting the summary page that is the first page on the system. So we're going to give you some consumer information, who the person actually is that you're renting to, dependents, uh, gender, marital status, citizenship, aka information. Uh, if you selected the ID verification, it's going to do that for you as well. And then your KYC or know your client verification is going to display on the front page as well. What we can see from this is that Fred Smith has matched. So he is captured on the Department of Home Affairs and the National Populations Register. His address details for FICA purposes matches as well. And then the telephone number has matched to what we see on the credit report as well. You can see confirmed SLA compliant. Um, meaning that that KYC is correct and you are really at this point in time um, complying with the law, complying with FICA. TPN rent check scorecard, one that I love going through. It's going to showcase so much information on this tenant. We're going to see a combined rental and credit account payment timeline. So what we can see from Fred Smith is that he made quite a lot of payments in January 2016, but payments started deteriorating from that date onwards. We can also see that the person, or rather Fred, has got a gold credit score of F. We score tenants from A to F, A being excellent, B being good, C being average, D being, be oh, sorry, E being below average, and then F being poor. So we can see this is not necessarily the type of tenant you want to be placing in your unit or premises. Credit report indicators. Now Justin, let's stop here for a moment. Good standing ratios. A very important concept when it comes to um, the TPN uh, rental scorecard. A good standing ratio is a person that either pays on time within a grace period or pays late. But basically what that means is that a person makes payment of the full rental amount and ancillary expenses, whatever has been loaded to the property management system or to Rentbook, um, before the end of that month. So that means that you don't have an arrears balance at the end of that specific month. What we can see over here is that Fred has made 13% of payments in good standing, really not great. 75% of credit payments and that information that you really want to showcase because at the end of the day it's going to depend on their affordability, how they're making those credit payments, 75%. And there's three negatives loaded on the system. Those negatives are made up of two judgments and one default. Now stopping here for a moment, if you're unsure what a default means, we use a colloquial term, we call it blacklisting, but basically that means that a default has been loaded against that person's profile. I'm going to showcase blacklistings and loading of defaults after we've run through the credit check and I'm going to show you exactly how to do that, but also the legal requirements that you need to comply with when it comes to blacklisting. We can also see that in terms of the credit history, 
the person is a poor payer, the affordability assessment is highly unlikely, and the probability of squatting. This affordability assessment is great because it doesn't just take into consideration the person's salary and the rental amounts, but it also takes into consideration the CPA accounts summary. So the monthly installments that that person is paying on all of their debt to service providers, to the banks, for loans, etc. I'm going to skip this portion for the moment. I'm going to show you that in the TransUnion report, or rather the TransUnion model, right up at the top. The credit report summary, ID verification, yes, active accounts 15, inactive accounts 2, there is, like we said, two judgments and one default. There's also three deeds on file, which we'll showcase in the deeds uh, module up at the top. Contact addresses, contact numbers, and query information. So who actually performed the query on Fred Smith? So incredibly vital information from your summary page. Now, I spoke to Chanel beforehand. She gives a lot of the systems training from TPN. If you require more in-depth training on the system specifically, please contact our help desk. Ask for one of the account managers. Chanel or Esty will be able to assist you with that in really showing you what the system can do for you. But from the summary page, like I said, I spoke to Chanel and she said a lot of clients just have a look at the summary page. Please don't just look at that. Have a look at all the different tabs. We're giving you all the data so that you can make an informed decision. If I click on the TPN tab, it's going to showcase all the information that's stored on the TPN database. We've got your header information, similar to the summary page, aka information, also known as information, a credit summary, and associated companies, so valuable SIPSI data. So if a person has been a director or is currently a director or a member of a closed corporation or company, we can show you how that movement has actually occurred. Justin, do we have any questions? Yes, Peter, we've had questions See, I'm coming intuitive. in. I can feel you. Yeah, you can feel me <laughs> <laughs> wanting to ask you. So we had a question from Matsi. Um, they're asking, if a tenant does not give permission to do the credit check, what do they do in that instance? Matsi, I would suggest from the get-go you don't take on that tenant. There's a reason that they don't want you to perform the credit check. It is an established practice for rentals to perform credit checks because at the end of the day, the only way that you will know how the person is going to pay you is having a look at how they've paid in the past. It's how they've paid the rental in the past, how they pay all their other accounts. So it's a vital thing to go and do. Um, I would not take on a tenant that refuses to have a credit check done on them. Yeah, I would agree. And we had another question from Regal Property Buyers. How does TPN assist with credit checks on individuals without RSA passport number, or probably without a South African ID or passport number, i.e. refugee and asylum seeker permits? That's a great question. Justin, I think we had that in the, in the first section one. as well. You are able to run the, um, the, 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 the specific reference numbers through on those. Um, but once again, if you're having trouble with doing that specific check, please just contact our help desk and they will assist you. Unfortunately, there is going to be some nuances over here. It will be, yeah. There is going to be some nuances over here. Um, let's take another example if you're performing, say for example, or need to perform a, um, a credit check on, a, um, on an NPO or something like that, uh, where they don't necessarily have um, a registration number. Um, I would suggest in instances like that to run a credit check on the individuals that is applying and actually putting the lease agreement in the individual's name um, because you need to have the information to be able to make the informed decision. Yeah. Um, and then we had a question from Henny. Um, he was querying on the summary page. I think we showed it, the report showed an F if the tenant qualifies. He says, but it's got about 10 creditors. He pays every month. Does it affect the rating? I think you discussed it because later in the chat, Henny went on to say that you had answered the question. Oh, fantastic. So Thank you. Good. good. Um, so I intuitively, once again, answer the question without knowing it. Okay. Then we've got a couple of questions on the KYC. I don't know if you want to answer those now or we leave them for the Q&A. Can we leave them until the Q&A? I see we, I, I am taking this quite slow. So let's leave them until the Q&A if you don't mind. And then one last question about the bank code, but you might cover that. Yes. It's just what does the TPM bank code option do? Okay, perfect. We can cover that once I get to the bank code. Thanks, Justin. So associated companies, like I said, the TPN accounts. So what this is going to showcase is how the tenant, or prospective tenant at least, has paid their rental in the past. So very important over here. What we can see is that 
um, this tenant rented a property through an individual landlord, what the rental amounts were, and specifically how that tenant made payments each and every single month. This is such important information. When you submit data into the Bureau, you're not just assisting yourself, but you're assisting the entire industry to make informed decisions. So, thank you very much for all of those that do submit data. It's very, very valuable information that you can really utilize to ensure that you have a successful rental at the end of the day. We can see a lot of did not pays, four in a row in 2000 uh, 2022, 2022. Uh, another individual landlord, we can see that the tenant has been blacklisted, a default information for being evicted, and the amount is 220,000 Rand in arrears. Rental amount showcased over there as well, um, as well as the property details. And then the final or second, uh, second last uh, leases has been a um, rental through a management company, the rental amount, as well as how that tenant has been paying. You can see from the second lease, really not a good payment profile record. Lease of a storage company and the tenant made payments intermittently on that of a rental of 7,200 Rand. Contact addresses, contact numbers and inquiry information will showcase at the bottom. Employment information, yay. Okay, spoke a lot about this yesterday uh, when we did a session on criminal checking for schools. But if you submit employment information directly into TPN, this data would also be available to you. You can do so purely by submitting your UIF files or directly from your payroll. If you need more information on that, please speak to our data team and they'll get you set up in submitting that information into the Bureau. We don't capture salary information, so meaning what the person gets paid every month, whether it's salary or commission. We purely show you um, how it has been structured, whether the person's currently busy working at a place, whether he's been terminated, dismissed, etc. If you do submit data, this is what it's going to look like, and you can see all the employment information of where the person has been working in the past. TPN actually has the only verified employment information database in the country. So a lot of valuable information over here to ensure that the tenant is actually working at the place they're saying they're working at. This is probably my favorite tab, the TransUnion tab. The reason for that is because it showcases so much information when it comes to the tenant's payment profile history and how they've made payments on all their other accounts. Consumer information captured up at the top again, your header information, aka information, also known as information, addresses, histories, uh, previous employment, your consumer counters, so the inquiry reasons and inquiry types and listings, etc. that has occurred over the last 12 months, 2 years and 3 plus years, and then the judgment information. Like I said, Fred Smith had two judgments in his name on the TransUnion tab. You're actually going to see what those judgments are for. The first judgment is from Fondamata of a Trust. It is uh, a magistrate of Pretoria um, case, and then the judgment amount was close to 3,000 Rand. The second judgment is for a primary school, obviously non-payment of school fees. We can see that is 160,000 Rand that that judgment was taken for, also in the magistrate's court of Pretoria. Now we get to the interesting stuff. CCA summary payment profile. This is going to showcase the total indebtedness of the potential tenant. What we can see over here is the current balance, so how much the person currently owes all your individual uh, or financial service providers at least, the banks, um, other companies that they might owe money to, the monthly installments on that debt, so how much they actually have to pay every month towards that credit, and then the total arrears amount, so payments that have not been made and with that is currently sitting at 520,000 Rand. Like I said, this is taken into consideration when we're doing the affordability assessment. So you can be assured um, if it shows that the person is not going to be able to pay or they're going to struggle to pay, it's very probably the case here. With the consumer payment profiles, we're really going to delve into those individual accounts of those service providers. So we can see there's a Markham's clothing account and how that's been paid. This is showcased a little bit differently than what the TPN payment profile records show. We've got the did not pays, partial payments, paid on times, grace periods, paid lates. Whereas with your um, TransUnion accounts, with the SACRA information that's received, it is one month in arrears, two months in arrears, three months in arrears, up to a 
the highest value is nine months in arrears that a person can go in terms of the submitted data. We can see currently two months in arrears, Truvis clothing account also two months in arrears. We can see the opening balance, the current balance and overdue payments. Mr. Price weekend clothing account, uh, ABSA credit card. We can also see that this uh, Fred Smith was six months in arrears. And then you get this weird indicator like an L. If you're uncertain what the L's, the H's and the W's mean, just click on view all key descriptions right over there where my mouse cursor is at. It's going to open up a page for you indicating what the L's, H's and W's mean. But basically, I know that an L means handed over, handed over to attorneys because the accounts were so far in arrears. American Swiss jewelry account, two months in arrears. Standard Bank vehicle asset finance, six months in arrears. Woolworths credit card, four months in arrears. Another clothing account, one month in arrears. Another car, six months in arrears. Another car, six months in arrears. Uh, another credit card, which is one month in arrears at that point in time. Another car that is nine months in arrears. That is why the monthly installments are so high, because there's so many payments that has been missed on all of these accounts. Your national loan registries accounts or your payday loans, that short-term lo lending, is also going to be showcased at the bottom. They open and close the accounts basically because usually the person opens it in one month and clears the account on the next month. So we can see there's a couple of loans or payday loans that has been taken out in Fred Smith's name. The ID verification, like I said, is an automatic ID verification that's going to bring back uh, if the person has been verified through the National Populations Register and the Department of Home Affairs, you can view the person's photograph simply by clicking view image over there. The biometrics, I love this one. Um, we're doing this through um, Comcorp, their curator system. Um, it is so cool to go and have a look at because you can, you can even go and do it yourself, all on yourself. Um, but you'll get a link, you can go click on that link, it's going to open up your camera, you can do your selfie check and then it's going to give you live biometrics of your potential applicant or yourself. If I click on the download report, this is what it's going to look like. We can see that it's a proof of identity through the curator system. The name requested, the name returned, the ID number, country of birth, ID card issued, all this other information on Fred Smith and then the captured photo versus the home affairs photograph. Justin, you did this incredibly well. It looks great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we can see that captured photograph of Fred Smith as well as the home affairs photo looks the same. So I'm just going to go out of that and back into my credit bureau system. Proof of address I'm going to skip over for today. Deeds database is going to showcase if the person has any current or previous properties in their name. Important, I think, if you're doing credit checks, um, on companies and you want to do credit checks on individual directors to ensure who can stand for surety if they've perhaps got a property in their name it's a good um, sort of indicator um, that you might be able to take on that surety should the company not be able to make rental payments. The bank code um, at the moment Justin please help me write here if I'm incorrect it's a little bit difficult to get bank codes through the banks even though it is able to request it through the TPN system um, the return dates are quite quite yeah quite high on these at the moment. So I would rather do something like an account verification if you are doing things like your FICA checks and you need to make sure that you're running debit orders onto the right account, rather do something like an account verification, which is going to give you all the information, including whether the account's been found at the specific bank, whether it accepts debits and credits, whether it's dormant, etc. Last two tabs is your qualifications tab and your crim track tab, if you have requested those. Obviously, please don't go and run uh, criminal checks directly on your tenants. I don't think it's really necessary. Plus, we need to show up with our commission of oaths, our technician, and go and do electronic and physical fingerprints for you. Um, but if you're a school, very important in terms of the Criminal Law, Sexual Offences and Related Matters Amendment Act, as well as the Children's Act, to run a credit check that uh, posts that against both the Child Protection Register and the Sexual Offences Register. Justin, that brings me to a close of the actual credit checks. Do we have any questions yes. specifically on the credit checks? Yes, we do. Yes. Um, the questions have been coming in fast and furiously. <laughs> um, we had a question from Brenda Smith. Can you only do a TPN credit check on a client if they are also only rented through an agency that uses TPN? Okay, so a great question. So yes, you need to have a TPN subscription to do a TPN credit check. 
but individual landlords can also perform their own credit checks through TPN. We've got a land, lot of landlords that obviously self-manage their properties mm -hmm. through the rent book system. If you need more information on that and your individual landlord looking for a property management system that's going to assist you um, in your administration as well as making that rental successful, go and have a look at rent book. You can contact once again, I see that's going to be posted on the screen right now, uh, the, the help desk email address as well as the contact number. You can speak, speak to our product specialist, Waylon, who will get back to you and showcase that system to you. But yes, as an individual landlord, you can also run the credit, uh, the credit check through TPN. Thank you, Peter. And then Venetia asked, what are the meanings of the one to nine that reflects, I think, on the TransUnion tab? We covered that. Yes. That's just the number of periods which the Perfect, Justin. person is in arrears. Yes. Um, and then we've had a question from uh, two of our delegates asked a similar question. Let me just quickly find it here. They were asking if they didn't print the TPN inquiry at the time or email it to um, their email address, can they access that at a later time without doing, redoing the check? That's a great question. I'll showcase that quickly. You just click on credit checks and you click on your credit check history. So then you can go and download that credit check directly from there. Yeah, and Richard was also saying that if he needs to access it in six months' time, it will still be there. Thank you, Justin. Thank Is that you. it? Good. I think that's it for now. Okay. My favorite thing to go through <laughs> is this My Data tab, because at the end of the day, we deal with this quite a lot. Um, it relates to um, the queries that we actually get from TPN, because at the end of the day, sometimes things do go wrong with your rentals. I want to showcase the process to you. I want to showcase the process to you for your um, successful collections at the end of the day. Remember, you're already running the system proactively because you're submitting data into TPN. So the, uh, the tenant's uh, credit profile is going to be negatively affected depending on those payments. But say, for example, you need to send a letter of demand. Click on the My Data tab. All of your tenants that have been loaded into the bureau is going to be listed over here. So obviously a number of pages that you can go through. You can click on the tenant that you need to send the letter of demand to. You're going to get the lease summary, so information on the lease agreements, whether the lease is active, the payments made, listings and the letters, the term of the lease agreement, the rental and when it's due, the landlord details, as well as the associated tenants. So what we can see on this lease agreement is it is a husband and a wife, Joe and Jane Bloggs, that is renting this property. To send a letter of demand through TPN Collections, just click on the letters tab right on the left hand side. It's going to show you what previous letters have been sent to this tenant. You just click on click here to send a new letter. And there's a number of different letters that you can send through the system. So let's just stop here for a moment. There's a number of letters that you can send directly through the system that is going to be vital, I think, in terms of successful collections. This TPN welcome letter is not going to cost you a cent, but what's going to happen there is the tenant the potential tenant is going to be sent a letter at the beginning of the lease agreement indicating that you're a client of TPN, TPN does this, if you don't pay, if you do pay, what is actually going to happen. I believe it sets the tone for a successful rental because then that tenant is aware what might happen if they don't make payments to you. Their credit profiles might be affected, they're going to get SMSs. So I think this is a vital one to go and do. And like I said, it's directly free off the TPN system. Then we get things like your lease cancellation, notice to vacate, I'm going to show you that later, a 20 day letter of demand, a 7 day letter of demand and then your registered 7 day and 20 day letters of demand. This is a stopping point for me. So you are going to send letters in accordance to your lease agreements but also in accordance to the legislation that applies to that actual contract, the tenant and the landlord. The registered and unregistered letters is purely based on your domicilium or notices clause in your contract, clause 27 of the TPN residential lease pack. It indicates how notices and correspondence must occur between the parties. And it is absolutely vital that you follow this clause to the letter when you're sending through correspondence and formal communication. Meaning that if you send it in a wrong delivery method, it is not going to be deemed to be received by that specific tenant. So make sure you're following your notices clause. The 20 day letter of demand and seven day letter of demand. The seven day letter of demand is a non-CPA compliant letter, 
meaning that the lease agreement has either rolled over on a month-to-month -month basis or Section 14 of the CPA is not applying to this lease agreement. So, for example, you've got a juristic entity tenant renting the property, but we've built in a CPA compliance check for you through the system. So for today's purposes, I'm going to choose a registered 20-day letter of demand. I always feel it's better to deliver letters in a number of methods to ensure that you're covered should this matter go to court and stand in front of a magistrate or judge. Click on the send button right over there. You can go and select the tenant to notify, Joe or Jane Blogs, and then I'm going to click next. It is automatically going to do a CPA compliance check for me. For, you can go and select the term, whether it's a fixed term contract or month to month. If my landlord is a natural person and my tenant is a natural person. Then click on the validate button up down at the bottom. This is directly from your lease contract. What you'll then see is the CPA compliance. Contract signed on or after 1st of April with a natural person. The CPA does apply. Please allow the tenant 20 business days to remedy any breach. Now you know you're sending out the correct letter of demand. You need to wait the full 20 business day time period before you can actually go and cancel that lease agreement. Fill out the default date, the amount due, the contact person who they'd like to contact. Please not something like Justin Beside note. <laughs> um, and uh, Justin's uh, cell phone number over here. Justin's not going to know what's going on. Uh, but the contact person at the actual property practitioner who will be dealing with this. You can have a look at the associated payments. Select the delivery options. So the address details which will automatically be populated for you. Because obviously you're loading data into the bureau. You can send the SMS to email the letter to the tenant and then CC yourself. Click on delivery confirmation and click send letter. Really as simple as that. We do all the admin, we do all the processes, we go and send out these letters directly to the tenant. Justin, do we have any questions? We do, Peter. We've got quite a few on the blacklisting, so let's quickly cover those. Annette Skuman asks, one of my tenants has just moved out over December without paying at all. Can I blacklist her? Okay, so I am going to deal with the process when I go through blacklistings, the actual process on the system, but perhaps just to give you the law over here. Your tenant needs to be three consecutive billing cycles in arrears. Mm -hmm. That means three months in arrears. So they need to have not made or they need to have made partial payments. They needed to basically be in arrears for three months in a row. And you needed to have sent a 20 business day letter of demand from TPN. If that has been done, the time periods have prescribed, you can blacklist the tenant through the system. Perfect. That covers Lorraine's question as well. She was asking when, when can I blacklist? Excellent. And then Zoe says, when blacklisting, do you load the amount as per the recent uh, letter of demand or per the current debt? If there are any child charges thereafter, and do you use the date for the current amount due or the date on which the lot was sent? Okay, so you can utilize both for the dates, uh, the date that the debt became due and payable, as well as the date um, that the letter of demand was sent to the tenant. Usually in an instance like this, the tenant is obviously already three months in arrears yes. um, and probably left the property already. So there shouldn't be really new amounts that have been indicated in the letter of demand or since you've sent the letter of demand. What I would suggest is if you've got a situation like that, please feel free to contact our help desk. They will assist you in including the correct amounts when having a look at the letter of demand. I don't necessarily want to give you a yes or no on something yeah. like this when there is a lot of nuance when it comes to the amounts that you've been included. So we're going to have to have a look at the letter of demand for you. But like I said, we can assist with that. Yeah, and then I see one a question just coming from Abigail saying, does TPN charge a fee for the letter to be sent to the tenant to his arrears? We do. So the letters of demand, um, their um, costing is directly on this letters page, right over there. Uh, your blacklistings, however, are completely for free. Correct. And the welcome letters are for That's free. That's correct, yeah. So one last question on the, uh, from Zoe. Can you list someone again if their previous listing has expired? No, you cannot. You only have one bite at the apple over here. So if the listing has expired after the 12 month period, unfortunately black listings only stay on a record for 12 months. You cannot go and reload that listing for the same date. The payment profile information, and this is why it's so valuable to submit data into the Bureau, is the payment profile information, what I showcased to you, the did not pays, partial payments, paid on times, etc., is going to showcase on the person's credit profile for a period of five years, so a lot longer than what the yeah. um, actual blacklisting would. 
And then another the question, there seem to be a couple around this, around the letters of demand and the cost. Can they onboard that to the, the tenant and include that cost? Yes, you can if you're using the right lease agreements <laughs> and it says that you can charge certain administrative expenses to the tenants, but only that charge. If we've charged you 90 Rand, you can bill the 90 Rand. You can't bill things like um, emotional disturbance <laughs> because you needed to go and click through a system or the time spent on actually sending that letter. It's very important just go, to go and select the correct charge, not added costs on that. Great, and then Tina was just quickly asking, the welcome letter only pops up after the tenant has paid the first month's rent. How can we get it earlier? That's a great question. I actually don't know this one. I like saying I don't know. Um, but Justin, I think uh, for Tina, would you please just email um, helpdesk at tpn.co.za and they'll assist you with that query. I'm actually not sure if the welcome letter... I think it is available. I think once the lease has been loaded on TPN... That's what I also think, yes. Uh, the, the lease is there. Um, you'll be able to select from letters and be able to send the welcome letter. Excellent. Thank you. Good. Last thing that I want to go through, you, uh, through with you today is this blacklistings tab and how to work through the process. We've already discussed the legislative requirements that you need to comply with, but just click on blacklistings over there. You can see previous blacklistings for the lease and active listings um, on this uh, tenant's profile that you've added. Click here to add a new blacklisting record. You can select the different tenants. Remember, you need to send two letters of demand if there's two tenants can't just encapsulate one letter of demand for both tenants. So make sure you're complying with the law here. The default date is going to be the payment due date that we've indicated in gray over here. Once again, if you're having a problem with that, just email help desk. The rating, very important over here. You can go and select on TPN and TransUnion. Don't just load it onto TPN because at the end of the day, then only TPN subscribers would see this. If you're blacklisting on TPN and TransUnion, all other credit providers will see this as well. I usually choose final notice. Um, it's the one that sort of makes most, most sense when it comes to TPN and TransUnion listings. List on TransUnion as well, the specific amount due that you are blacklisting for, and then the reason. Short reason over here, tenant has not paid for three months in a row. You don't need to write a novel or a novella when it comes to the reason for the blacklisting. Um, just write something short. Tenant hasn't paid for three months. The associated payments, so we can already see from the payment profile record that I would not be able to blacklist this tenant because this was a paid late. If this was something like a partial payment, we can see that there's three consecutive months in arrears. If this was all partial payments, you'd also be able to blacklist. If this was all did not pays, you would be able to. But because this is a paid late, it means that the tenant settled that account before the end of the month and you would need to wait a further month to blacklist. Click on the NCA compliance declaration and click save listing. The tenant then will be automatically notified that they have been blacklisted and hopefully you'll get your payment soon thereafter. Justin, that brings us to the end of our formal session for today. I'm sure you've got a lot of questions. Let's run through them. Very exciting. Okay, Peter, yeah, there are lots here. I'm going to try to cover all of them. Still just on the, back, on the blacklisting, uh, we've had similar questions from Tammy and Barbara asking, can you blacklist on TPN if a letter of demand was sent to the client, but it's not necessarily a TPN letter of demand, it was possibly sent by another attorney? Most certainly, but that letter of demand needs to contain a provision that says that if the tenant does not make payment, their credit profile will be negatively affected. So there is specific wording that needs to go into your letter of demand. That's what I would suggest when it comes to blacklistings, that the TPN letter be sent because the wording is correct for that specific blacklisting. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Kathy is asking, who decides if we must blacklist? Who decides? Yeah. Okay, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so the landlord uh, would obviously need to decide in an instance like this. I think that's basically the question. Yes. If you're a managing agent, um, you're a property practitioner, um, I would suggest communicating with the landlord prior to blacklisting. Also, just a nuance over here, I would suggest that you blacklist at the end of the lease period when the person has absconded or left the property rather than blacklisting through, throughout the process. Um, because at the end of the day, you're going to have amounts that are still continuing to update. So you want to be blacklisting for that full amount. I mean, yes, you can 
add multiple blacklistings if it's a different cause of action, but I would rather wait until the end of the lease period to go and do so. But the landlord makes that decision. Please ask your landlord if you can do that. Yeah, uh, that's what Cathy was also asking. Does she have to get the landlord to agree to that? I would suggest so, yes. He's your client or she's your client at the end of the day. Um, so I would rather run it past them. Okay, um, Annette was asking, so you just want to know about the 12 months. Is that the blacklisting then? After 12 months, it appears from the person's profile. So I think that's just talking about how long the blacklisting stays. The retention, stays, period, the retention yeah. period. So the blacklisting will stay active for a period of 12 months. Um, and like I said, the payment profile records will stay active for a period of five years. And then it's also going to not delete the entire account, but it's going to delete month for month for month after that five year period. And then Anna Marie was saying, once a person has been blacklisted, must you remove the listing if the person settles the outstanding amount in full? Yes, most certainly. You can notify us um, and then we can remove the blacklisting for that person after payment has been made. Great. Um, Julie asks, if a tenant, a lady, uses her maiden name and then her married surname, do you have to do a check on both the surnames? No, the check will run through the ID number um, or the passport number. Um, as you can see through the system, it also picks up on also known as information yeah. and previous names, etc. So it's going to run that check through the specific ID or passport number. And will automatically link, link the names. Thanks, Justin. Um, sorry, Peter, just quickly get another no one problem. here from Westhoff. This is talking about, I think, the biometrics. The photo that is added to the full report, is that the home affairs photo and hence confirming the biometrics? That's correct, yes. It's the photo that is uh, um, taken at home affairs would be the photograph that displays on the actual credit check. When you're going into the biometrics, like I showed you through that, uh, through that link, it's going to obviously showcase both photographs, but on the actual credit check, it would be the, the ID photograph that's, that's on home affairs or the passport photograph. Yeah. yeah, and the algorithms that we use do some clever matching to see how the person's aged and it matches the photos. Oh, brilliant, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, Peter, it's quite clear. No problem. Um, we had a question earlier from Zander. Under which circumstances can the tenant's property be used as surety? Okay, so that's a, gr a great question. Um, you wouldn't necessarily utilize the tenant's property as surety, but you'll sign up as surety. So the example I always give with this would be something like a um, person that has just finished studying. They don't necessarily have a credit profile. You sign a lease agreement with that specific party and you get one of the parents or both parents to stand as surety for the payment of the rental and ancillary expenses um, from the lease agreement. So they'll actually stand in um, should the tenant not make payment of those accounts. So that's how surety works, but you wouldn't necessarily attach something like a property mm -hmm. or attach something like a, a, a movable property like a car as surety. Um, that will obviously happen in instances where there's an attachment order or the sheriff goes out to do something like a rent interdict summons, but you'll attach the person rather than the specific property. And then question from Henny, can you blacklist the tenant if the court granted an eviction order? Yes, you most certainly can. So you can blacklist throughout the entire process. Um, the eviction order is not necessarily something that is going to showcase as a judgment unless it's been loaded. It's usually only judgments for monetary claims. So it c you could possibly get a cost order, etc. You'll need to have that taxed, um, but it, it, you, you could be like blacklist off that period, yes, most certainly. I think one of the records actually we went through said blacklisting evicted and put the final amount. Yeah, I think so. Um, Annie asks, how do we remove a tenant's name from TransUnion after they have paid the full amount owing? I know lawyers charge to remove the name, from the other bureaus? Um, great question. So the disputes process is actually th uh, free, three, <laughs> free uh, through any of the credit bureaus. What that means is that any person who has adverse information on their profile that they believe to be incorrect um, can contact the bureaus individually. Um, they lodge a dispute um, through the systems that they've got in place. Um, the credit bureau itself will then contact their client or the person that has made the listing or loaded the payment profile. They'll receive supporting documentation and that dispute would need to be closed within a period of 20 business days after loading of the listing. Um, so any credit bureau has to have that dispute's process. We obviously have one as well, um, but that is the way to get 
information removed from our credit bureaus through that formal disputes process that's set out in terms of the National Credit Act. Can I read an in interesting one here from Tamara. She says, if a tenant vacates the premises after two months, um, they've paid on time for those, the duration of those two months. However, they did not give uh, notice that they were obviously moving out. What is the blacklisting process there, considering there's no arrears? I like your nuanced questions today. Yeah. <laughs> um, so at the end of the lease period, it, it would really depend. If Section 14 of the CPA applies, the landlord would actually have to notify the tenant that the lease period is coming up uh, or the end of the lease period rather is coming up. If there are any changes that are going to be made in the contract, rental amounts, new deposit amounts, etc., that would need to be indicated in the letter with the 40 to 80 business days that has gone out. The tenant then has an opportunity to respond. But the problem here when it comes to this piece of legislation is that once a contract ends, it ends. So if a tenant is not staying in the premises after the termination date, even if notice has not been provided, then it is few and far between times that the landlord would actually be able to hold the tenant liable for a further period because that contract hasn't rolled over on the month to month basis. As a property practitioner, once again, like I said in the beginning, rentals is administratively burdensome. Through the TPN system, it's not. If you're using the right stuff, it's really not. But you need to send out that 40 to 80 business days notice. And if you get no response, or even if you get a response saying, yes, like to renew, you send out those agreements as quickly as possible. Your renewal addendums, your new lease agreement. And if those contracts are not signed, you take it as if that lease agreement is not going to be renewed because you could be sitting in a position where the tenant just vacates on the termination date. There's no further agreement being signed or entered into and the landlord can't hold the tenant liable. So follow up if the tenant has not returned your calls, he's not returned your emails, send out notices, post the property back on the listing sites, um, on, your, on your prop bay and on your rent bay and private property, whatever it might be, and ensure that you start trying to get new tenants for that property. If the tenant sees that there's new tenants coming and there's viewings occurring, I'm sure he's going to go, wait, wait, listen here, we ne need to actually renew and sign new documentation. But it's important that it's your follow-ups. You need to go and do so as a property practitioner or as a landlord. Okay, then Jackie is asking, when a tenant has been blacklisted by an agency and has then been handed over to a debt collector, Blacklisting is for the period of one year. Can this be updated again as blacklisted by the debt collector? No, it would not. You can only blacklist for a single cause of action for a single debt. The debt collector can obviously follow different procedures. Things like uh, sending out new letters, etc., phoning the tenant, trying to contact them, but that blacklisting will only be available for the period of 12 months and you can't reload that listing. And Rachel's asking, does TPN have a rental agreement which we can use and edit to suit our own needs or agreements? Look at the smile on my face. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we've recently updated the TPN residential lease pack, sales pack, as well as the commercial lease pack um, with the new Property Practitioners Act. Um, we update these documents every three months or so, depending on legislation changes, court decisions, um, opinions by different attorneys. the TPN shop, um, www.shop.tpn.co.za. They can all be purchased from that. Um, the lease pack, specifically residential lease pack, contain not just lease agreements, but all your different contracts. So your mandates, your notices, your application forms, your different lease agreements, whether it's student accommodation, holiday accommodation, month to month, juristic entity leases, natural person lease agreements. And they are available, Justin, I believe, for, for a price of 980 Rand per annum. Um, they're a subscription service, so you're going to pay for that period. And then you're going to be billed monthly um, after the first year. But you can go and utilize those. They're all available from uh, shop.tpn.co.za. Yeah, that's correct. I think it's 1,100. Thank you very much, and including that. Yeah. There's a ton of documents. Uh, we've had a couple of questions from Marcel and Kathy, just saying that they're new to TPN. They've only just started working Welcome. Uh, and will this webinar be available at a later point? Yes, it will be. All of the previous webinars we've done, um, whether it's relating to the system, legal training, is all available directly through the YouTube channel on Access. So you just type in TPM Credit Bureau, you go and access our page, you need to subscribe to watch the videos. 
I'm just saying that, okay? <laughs> obviously don't, but please go and do so. Drop a like for us. Um, and then if you subscribe or obviously um, through that system and click the notifications bell, you're going to be notified of any new upcoming trainings as well as new videos that we've posted on our channel. So for all of those listening um, while you're busy at the moment, just subscribe to our page and then, or rather the channel, and then you'll get notifications of everything that's going on at TPN. Thank you. Um, you know, another question on blacklistings. It seems to be a very popular yes, topic. looks so. Um, after blacklisting a tenant that has moved out already and they do not want to pay or anything and they're not communicating any other, not responding to any other communications rather, what do we do, Larisca is asking. So it depends on the amount of the debt, I believe. Um, you can obviously approach an attorney to try and collect that money for you. Um, you can go and trace the tenant and try and, uh, and, and try and figure out where they currently are so that you can serve things like, like a summons. Um, but it depends on the amount of the debt. Um, obviously, contacting attorneys at that point in time is pretty expensive. Um, and the legal process could be pretty expensive. So what I would suggest for a question like that, mm. pop me a mail, pop the legal help desk a mail, legal at tpn.co.za, and one of the legal eagles will get back to you, just indicating what they believe would be the best process for you to follow. Justin, we've already run out of time. Can you believe an hour went so quickly through the, um, through the credit bureau system? Um, if you wouldn't mind, um, I don't like to really run over training sessions. I feel yeah. people only booked for an hour. I'm sure they've got lots of things to go and do, lots of credit checks to go and run, and lots of, uh, hopefully not lots of letters of the bond and blacklistings to go and uh, utilize. So if we didn't get into to any questions, we'll respond to those uh, from the help desk or from legal. Um, we saved those queries. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Like I said, go and subscribe and like our various social media pages. Um, and we'll see you again very soon.